Chapter nineteen of David Copperfield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ty Hines. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter nineteen. I look about me and make a discovery. I am doubtful whether I was at heart glad or sorry when my school days drew to an end, and the time came for my leaving Dr. Strong's. I had been very happy there, I had a great attachment for the doctor, and I was eminent and distinguished in that little world. For these reasons I was sorry to go, but for other reasons, unsubstantial enough, I was glad. Misty ideas of being a young man at my own disposal, of the importance attaching to a young man at his own disposal, of the wonderful things to be seen and done by that magnificent animal, and the wonderful effects he could not fail to make upon society, lured me away. So powerful were these visionary considerations in my boyish mind, that I seem, according to my present way of thinking, to have left school without natural regret. The separation has not made the impression on me that other separations have. I try in vain to recall how I felt about it, and what its circumstances were, but it is not momentous in my recollection. I suppose the opening prospect confused me. I know that my juvenile experiences went for little or nothing then, and that life was more like a great fairy story, which I was just about to begin to read, than anything else. My aunt and I had held a great many deliberations on the calling to which I should be devoted. For a year or more I had endeavoured to find a satisfactory answer to her often repeated question, what should I like to be? But I had no particular liking that I could discover for anything. If I could have been inspired with a knowledge of the science of navigation, taken the command of a fast sailing expedition, and gone round the world on a triumphant voyage of discovery, I think I might have considered myself completely suited. But, in absence of any such miraculous provision, my desire was to apply myself to some pursuit that would not lie too heavily upon her purse, and to do my duty in it, whatever it might be. Mr. Dick had regularly assisted at our councils with a meditative and sage demeanour. He never made a suggestion but once, and on that occasion, I don't know what put it in his head, he suddenly proposed that I should be a brazier. My aunt received this proposal so very ungraciously that he never ventured on a second, but ever afterwards confined himself to looking watchfully at her for her suggestions and rattling his money. "'Trot, I'll tell you what, my dear,' said my aunt one morning in the Christmas season when I left school. "'As this knotty point is still unsettled, and we must not make a mistake in our decision if we can help it, I think we had better take a little breathing time. In the meanwhile you must try to look at it from a new point of view, and not as a schoolboy.' "'I will, aunt.' "'It has occurred to me,' pursued my aunt, "'that a little change and a glimpse of life out of doors may be useful in helping you to know your own mind, and form a cooler judgment. Suppose you were to go down into that old part of the country again, for instance, and see that—that that out of the way woman with the savagest of names,' said my aunt, rubbing her nose, for she could never thoroughly forgive Peggotty for being so called. "'Of all things in the world, aunt, I should like it best.' Well said my aunt. That's lucky, for I should like it too. But it's natural and rational that you should like it, and I am very well persuaded that whatever you do, Trot, will always be natural and rational. I hope so, aunt. Your sister, Betsy Trotwood, said my aunt, would have been as natural and rational a girl as ever breathed. You'll be worthy of her, won't you? I hope I shall be worthy of you, aunt. That will be enough for me. It's a mercy that poor baby of a mother of yours didn't live said my aunt, looking at me approvingly, or she'd have been so vain of her boy by this time that her soft little head would have been completely turned, if there was anything of it left to turn. Uh, my aunt always excused any weakness of her own in my behalf by transferring it in this way to my poor mother. Bless me, Trotwood, how you do remind me of her. Pleasantly, I hope, aunt, I said. He's as like her, Dick, said my aunt emphatically. He's as like her as she was that afternoon before she began to fret. Bless my heart, he's as like her as he can look at me out of his two eyes. Is he indeed? said Mr. Dick. And he's like David, too, said my aunt decisively. He's very like David, said Mr. Dick. But what I want you to be, Trot, resumed my aunt, I don't mean physically, but morally, you are very well physically, is a firm fellow, a fine firm fellow with a will of your own, with resolution said my aunt, shaking her cap at me and clenching her hand. "'With determination, with character, Trot, with strength of character that will not be influenced, except on good reason by anybody or by anything. That's what I want you to be. 
That's what your father and mother might both have been, heaven knows, and been the better for it. I intimated that I hoped I should be what she described. That you may begin, in a small way, to have a reliance upon yourself, and to act for yourself, said my aunt. I shall send you upon your trip alone. I did think once of Mr. Dick's going with you, but on second thoughts I shall keep him to take care of me. Mr. Dick for a moment looked a little disappointed, until the honour and dignity of having to take care of the most wonderful woman in the world restored the sunshine to his face. Besides, said my aunt, there's the memorial. Oh, certainly, said Mr. Dick in a hurry. I intend, Trotwood, to get that done immediately. It really must be done immediately, and then it will go in, you know, and then, said Mr. Dick, after checking himself and pausing a long time, there will be a pretty kettle of fish. In pursuance of my aunt's second scheme I was shortly afterwards fitted with a handsome purse of money and a portmanteau, and tenderly dismissed upon my expedition. At parting my aunt gave me some good advice, and a good many kisses, and said that as her object was that I should look about me, and should think a little, she would recommend me to stay a few days in London, if I liked it, either on my way down to Suffolk or in coming back. In a word, I was at liberty to do what I would, for three weeks or a month, and no other conditions were imposed upon my freedom than the before-mentioned thinking and looking about me, and a pledge to write three times a week and faithfully report myself. I went to Canterbury first, that I might take leave of Agnes and Mr. Wickfield, my old room in whose house I had not yet relinquished, and also of the good doctor. Agnes was very glad to see me, and told me that the house had not been like itself since I had left it. I am sure I am not like myself when I am away said I. I seem to want my right hand when I miss you, though that's not saying much, for there's no head in my right hand, and no heart. Everyone who knows you consults with you, and is guided by you, Agnes. Everyone who knows me spoils me, I believe, she answered, smiling. No, it's because you are like no one else. You are so good, and so sweet-tempered. You have such a gentle nature, and you are always right. You talk, said Agnes, breaking into a pleasant laugh as she sat at work, as if I were the late Miss Larkins. "'Come, it's not fair to abuse my confidence,' I answered, reddening at the recollection of my blue enslaver. "'But I shall confide in you just the same, Agnes. I can never grow out of that. Whenever I fall into trouble or fall in love, I shall always tell you, if you will let me, even when I come to fall in love in earnest.' "'Why, you have always been in earnest,' said Agnes, laughing again. "'Oh, that was as a child or a schoolboy,' said I, laughing in my turn, not without being a little shamefaced. "'Times are altering now, and I suppose I shall be in a terrible state of earnestness one day or other. My wonder is that you are not in earnest yourself by this time, Agnes.' Agnes laughed again and shook her head. "'Oh, I know you are not,' said I, "'because if you had been you would have told me, or at least, for I saw a faint blush in her face, you would have let me find it out for myself. But there is no one that I know of who deserves to love you, Agnes.' Someone of a nobler character, and more worthy altogether than any one I have ever seen here, must rise up before I give my consent. In the time to come I shall have a wary eye on all admirers, and exact a great deal from the successful one, I assure you." We had gone on so far in a mixture of confidential jest and earnest that had long grown naturally out of our familiar relations, begun as mere children. But Agnes, now suddenly lifting up her eyes to mine and speaking in a different manner, said, Trotwood, there's something that I want to ask you, and that I may not have another opportunity of asking for a long time, perhaps. Something I would ask, I think, of no one else. Have you observed any gradual alteration in Papa? I had observed it, and had often wondered whether she had, too. I must have shown as much now in my face, for her eyes were in a moment cast down, and I saw tears in them. Tell me what it is, she said in a low voice. I think— "'Shall I be quite plain, Agnes, liking him so much?' "'Yes,' she said. "'I think he does himself no good by the habit that has increased upon him since I first came here. He is often very nervous, or I fancy so.' "'It is not fancy,' said Agnes, shaking her head. "'His hand trembles, his speech is not plain, and his eyes look wild. I have remarked that at those times, and when he is least like himself, he is most certain to be wanted on some business.' "'By Uriah?' said Agnes. "'Yes. And the sense of being unfit for it, or of not having understood it, or of having shown his condition in spite of himself, seems to make him so uneasy that next day he is worse, and next day worse, and so he becomes jaded and haggard. 
do not be alarmed by what I say, Agnes, but in this state I saw him only the other evening lay down his head upon his desk and shed tears like a child. Her hand passed softly before my lips while I was yet speaking, and in a moment she had met her father at the door of the room and was hanging upon his shoulder. The expression of her face as they both looked towards me I felt to be very touching. There was such deep fondness for him and gratitude to him for all his love and care in her beautiful look, and there was such a fervent appeal to me to deal tenderly by him, even in my inmost thoughts, and to let no harsh construction find any place against him. She was at once so proud of him and devoted to him, yet so compassionate and sorry and so reliant upon me to be so too, that nothing she could have said would have expressed more to me or moved me more. We were to drink tea at the doctor's. We went there at the usual hour, and round the study fireside found the doctor and his young wife and her mother. The doctor, who made as much of my going as if I were going to China, received me as an honoured guest, and called for a log of wood to be thrown on the fire that he might see the face of his old pupil reddening in the blaze. "'I shall not see many more new faces in Trotwoodstead, Wickfield,' said the doctor, warming his hands. "'I am getting lazy, and I want ease. I shall relinquish all my young people in another six months, and lead a quieter life.' "'You have said so any time these ten years, doctor,' Mr. Wickfield answered. "'But now I mean to do it,' returned the doctor. "'My first master will succeed me. I am in earnest at last. So you'll soon have to arrange our contracts, and to bind us firmly to them like a couple of knaves.' "'And to take care,' said Mr. Wickfield, "'that you are not imposed upon, eh? As you certainly would be in any contract you should make for yourself. Well, I am ready. There are worse tasks than that in my calling.' "'I shall have nothing to think of then,' said the doctor with a smile, "'but my dictionary, and this other contract bargain. Annie.' As Mr. Wickfield glanced towards her, sitting at the tea-table by Agnes, she seemed to me to avoid his look with such unwonted hesitation and timidity that his attention became fixed upon her as if something were suggested to his thoughts. "'There is a post come in from India, I observe,' he said after a short silence. "'By the by, and letters from Mr. Jack Maldon,' said the doctor. "'Indeed, poor dear Jack,' said Mrs. Markleham, shaking her head. "'That trying climate, like living, they tell me, on a sand-heap underneath a burning-glass. He looked strong, but he wasn't. My dear doctor, it was his spirit, not his constitution, that he ventured on so boldly. Annie, my dear, I am sure you must perfectly recollect that your cousin never was strong.' "'Not what could be called robust, you know,' said Mrs. Markleham, with emphasis, looking round upon us generally, "'from the time when my daughter and himself were children together, and walking about arm in arm the live-long day.' Annie, thus addressed, made no reply. "'Do I gather from what you say, ma'am, that Mr. Maldon is ill?' asked Mr. Wickfield. "'Ill?' replied the old soldier. "'My dear sir, he's all sorts of things.' "'Except well,' said Mr. Wickfield. "'Except well, indeed.' said the old soldier. He has had dreadful strokes of the sun, no doubt, and jungle fevers and agues, and every kind of thing you can mention. As to his liver, said the old soldier resignedly, that, of course, he gave up altogether when he first went out. Does he say all this? asked Mr. Wickfield. Say, my dear sir, returned Mrs. Markleham, shaking her head and her fan. You little know my poor Jack Maldon when you ask that question. Say, not he. You might drag him at the heels of four wild horses first. Mamma, said Mrs. Strong. Annie, my dear, returned her mother, once for all, I must really beg that you will not interfere with me unless it is to confirm what I say. You know as well as I do that your cousin Maldon would be dragged at the heels of any number of wild horses. Why should I confine myself to four? I won't confine myself to four. Eight. Sixteen, two and thirty, rather than say anything calculated to overturn the doctor's plans. Uh, Wickfield's plans, said the doctor, stroking his face and looking penitently at his adviser. Uh, that is to say, our joint plans for him. I said myself, abroad or at home. And I said, said Mr. Wickfield gravely, abroad. I was the means of sending him abroad. It's my responsibility. Oh, responsibility! said the old soldier. Everything was done for the best, my dear Mr. Wickfield. Everything was done for the kindest and best, we know. But if the dear fellow can't live there, he can't live there. And if he can't live there, he'll die there, sooner than he'll overturn the doctor's plans. I know him, said the old soldier, fanning herself, in a sort of calm, prophetic agony. And I know he'll die there sooner than he'll overturn the doctor's plans. 
well well ma'am said the doctor cheerfully i am not bigoted to my plans i can overturn them myself i can substitute some other plans if mr jack maldon comes home on account of ill health he must not be allowed to go back and we must endeavour to make some more suitable and fortunate provision for him in this country mrs markleham was so overcome by this generous speech which i need not say she had not at all expected or led up to that she could only tell the doctor it was like himself and go several times through that operation of kissing the stick of her fan and then tapping his hand with it after which she gently chid her daughter annie for not being more demonstrative when such kindnesses were showered for her sake on her old playfellow and entertained us with some particulars concerning other deserving members of her family whom it was desirable to set on their deserving legs all this time her daughter annie never once spoke or lifted up her eyes all this time mr wickfield had his glance upon her as she sat by his own daughter's side it appeared to me that he never thought of being observed by any one but was so intent upon her and upon his own thoughts in connection with her as to be quite absorbed he now asked what mr jack maldon had actually written in reference to himself and to whom he had written why here said mrs markleham taking a letter from the chimney-piece above the doctor's head the dear fellow says to the doctor himself where is it oh i am sorry to inform you that my health is suffering severely and that i fear i may be reduced to the necessity of returning home for a time as the only hope of restoration that's pretty plain poor fellow his only hope of restoration but annie's letter is plainer still annie show me the letter again oh, not now mamma she pleaded in a low tone my dear you absolutely are on some subjects one of the most ridiculous persons in the world returned her mother and perhaps the most unnatural to the claims of your own family we never should have heard of the letter at all i believe unless i asked for it myself do you call that confidence my love towards dr strong i am surprised you ought to know better the letter was reluctantly produced and as i handed it to the old lady i saw how the unwilling hand from which i took it trembled now let us see said mrs markleham putting her glass to her eye where the passage is the remembrance of old times my dearest annie and so forth it's not there the amiable old proctor who's he dear annie how illegibly your cousin maldon writes and how stupid i am doctor of course ah amiable indeed and here she left off to kiss her fan again and shake it at the doctor who was looking at us in a state of placid satisfaction now i have found it you may not be surprised to hear annie no to be sure knowing that he never really was strong what did i just say now that i have undergone so much in this distant place as to have decided to leave it at all hazards on sick leave if i can on total resignation if that is not to be obtained what i have endured and do endure here is insupportable and but for the promptitude of that best of creatures said mrs markleham telegraphing the doctor as before and refolding the letter it would be insupportable to me to think of mr wickfield said not one word though the old lady looked to him as if for his commentary on this intelligence but sat severely silent with his eyes fixed on the ground long after the subject was dismissed and other topics occupied us he remained so seldom raising his eyes unless to rest them for a moment with a thoughtful frown upon the doctor or his wife or both the doctor was very fond of music agnes sang with great sweetness and expression and so did mrs strong they sang together and played duets together and we had quite a little concert but i remarked two things first that though annie soon recovered her composure and was quite herself there was a blank between herself and mr wickfield which separated them wholly from each other secondly that mr wickfield seemed to dislike the intimacy between her and agnes and to watch it with uneasiness and now i must confess the recollection of what i had seen on that night when mr maldon went away first began to return upon me with a meaning it had never had and to trouble me the innocent beauty of her face was not as innocent to me as it had been i mistrusted the natural grace and charm of her manner and when i looked at agnes by her side and thought how good and true agnes was suspicions arose within me that it was an ill-assorted friendship she was so happy in it herself however and the other was so happy too that they made the evening fly away as if it were but an hour it closed in an incident which i well remember they were taking leave of each other and agnes was going to embrace and kiss her when mr wickfield stepped between them as if by accident and drew agnes quickly away then i saw as though all the intervening time had been cancelled and i was still standing in the doorway on the night of the departure the expression of that night in the face of mrs strong 
as it confronted his i cannot say what an impression this made upon me or how impossible i found it when i thought of her afterwards to separate her from this look and remember her face in its innocent loveliness again it haunted me when i got home i seemed to have left the doctor's roof with a dark cloud lowering on it the reverence that i had for his grey head was mingled with commiseration for his faith in those who were treacherous to him and with resentment against those who injured him the impending shadow of a great affliction and the great disgrace that had no distinct form in it yet fell like a stain upon the quiet place where i had worked and played as a boy and did it a cruel wrong i had no pleasure in thinking any more of the grave old broad-leaved aloe trees which remained shut up in themselves a hundred years together and of the trim smooth grass plot and the stone urns and the doctor's walk and the congenial sound of the cathedral bell hovering above them all it was as if the tranquil sanctuary of my boyhood had been sacked before my face and its peace and honour given to the winds but morning brought with it my parting from the old house which agnes had filled with her influence and that occupied my mind sufficiently i should be there again soon no doubt i might sleep again perhaps often in my old room but the days of my inhabiting there were gone and the old time was past i was heavier at heart when i packed up such of my books and clothes as still remained there to be sent to dover than i cared to show to uriah heep who was so officious to help me that i uncharitably thought he might be glad i was going i got away from agnes and her father somehow with an indifferent show of being very manly and took my seat upon the box of the london coach i was so softened and forgiving going through the town that i had half a mind to nod to my old enemy the butcher and throw him five shillings to drink but he looked such a very obdurate butcher as he stood scraping the great block in the shop and moreover his appearance was so little improved by the loss of a front tooth which i had knocked out that i thought it best to make no advances the main object on my mind i remember when we got fairly on the road was to appear as old as possible to the coachman and to speak extremely gruff the latter point i achieved at great personal inconvenience but i stuck to it because i felt it was a grown-up sort of a thing are you going through sir said the coachman yes william i said condescendingly i knew him i am going to london i shall go down into suffolk afterwards shooting sir said the coachman he knew as well as i did that it was just as likely at that time of year i was going down there whaling but i felt complimented too i don't know i said pretending to be undecided whether i shall take a shot or not birds has got very shy i'm told said william so i understand said i is suffolk your county sir asked william yes i said with some importance suffolk's my county i've told the dumplings is uncommon fine down there said william i was not aware of it myself but i felt it necessary to uphold the institutions of my county and to evince a familiarity with them so i shook my head as much as to say i believe you and the punches said william there's cattle a suffolk punch when he's a good un is worth his weight in gold did you ever breed any suffolk punches yourself sir no i said not exactly here's a gentleman behind me i'll pound it said william as has bred em by old sale the gentleman spoken of was a gentleman with a very unpromising squint and a prominent chin who had a tall white hat on with a narrow flat brim and whose close-fitting drab trousers seemed to button all the way up outside his legs from his boots to his hips his chin was cocked over the coachman's shoulder so near to me that his breath quite tickled the back of my head and as i looked at him he leered at the leaders with the eye with which he didn't squint in a very knowing manner ain't you asked william ain't i what said the gentleman behind bred them suffolk punches old sale i should think so said the gentleman there ain't no sort of horse that i ain't bred there ain't no sort of dog horses and dogs is some men's fancy they're wills and drink to me lodgings wife and children reading writing and arithmetic snuff tobacco and sleep that ain't the sort of man to see sitting behind a coach box is it though said william in my ear as he handled the reins i construed this remark into an indication of a wish that he should have my place so i blushingly offered to resign it well if you don't mind sir said william i think it would be more correct i have always considered this as the first fall i had in life when i booked my place at the coach office i had had box seat written against the entry and had given the bookkeeper half a crown i was got up in a special greatcoat and shawl expressly to do honour to that distinguished eminence 
had glorified myself upon it a good deal, and had felt that I was a credit to the coach, and here, in the very first stage, I was supplanted by a shabby man with a squint who had no other merit than smelling like a livery stables, and being able to walk across me more like a fly than a human being, while the horses were at a canter. A distrust of myself, which has often beset me in life on small occasions, and when it should have been better away, was assuredly not stopped in its growth by this little incident outside the Canterbury coach. It was in vain to take refuge in gruffness of speech. I spoke from the pit of my stomach for the rest of the journey, but I felt completely extinguished and dreadfully young. It was curious and interesting, nevertheless, to be sitting up there behind four horses, well-educated, well-dressed, and with plenty of money in my pocket, and to look out for the places where I had slept on my weary journey. I had abundant occupation for my thoughts, in every conspicuous landmark on the road. When I looked down at the trampers whom we passed, and saw that well-remembered style of face turned up, I felt as if the tinker's blackened hand were in the bosom of my shirt again when we clattered through the narrow street of Chatham, and I caught a glimpse in passing of the lane where the old monster lived who had bought my jacket, I stretched my neck eagerly to look for the place where I had sat in the sun and in the shade waiting for my money. When we came at last within a stage of London, and passed the veritable Salem house where Mr. Creakle had laid about him with a heavy hand, I would have given all I had for lawful permission to get down and thrash him, and let all the boys out like so many caged sparrows. We went to the Golden Cross at Charing Cross, then a mouldy sort of establishment in the close neighbourhood. A waiter showed me to the coffee-room, and a chambermaid introduced me to my small bedchamber, which smelt like a hackney-coach, and was shut up like a family vault. I was still painfully conscious of my youth, for nobody stood in any awe of me at all, the chambermaid being utterly indifferent to my opinions on any subject, and the waiter being familiar with me and offering advice to my inexperience. "'Well, now,' said the waiter, in a tone of confidence, "'what would you like for dinner? "'Young gentleman likes poultry in general. "'Have a fowl.' "'I told him as majestically as I could "'that I wasn't in the humour for a fowl. "'Ain't you?' said the waiter. "'Young gentleman is generally tired of beef and mutton. "'Have a wheel cutlet.' "'I assented to this proposal, "'in default of being able to suggest anything else. "'Do you care for taters?' said the waiter, "'with an insinuating smile and his head on one side.' A young gentleman generally has been overdosed with taters. I commanded him, in my deepest voice, to order a veal cutlet and potatoes, and all things fitting, and to inquire at the bar if there were any letters for Trotwood Copperfield, Esquire, which I knew there were not, and couldn't be, but thought it manly to appear to expect. He soon came back to say that there were none, at which I was much surprised, and began to lay the cloth for my dinner in a box by the fire. While he was so engaged, he asked me what I would take with it, and on my replying, half a pint of sherry, I thought it a favourable opportunity, I am afraid, to extract that measure of wine from the stale leavings at the bottoms of several small decanters. I am of this opinion, because while I was reading the newspaper, I observed him behind a low wooden partition, which was his private apartment, very busy pouring out of a number of those vessels into one, like a chemist and druggist, making up a prescription. When the wine came too, I thought it flat, and it certainly had more English crumbs in it than were to be expected in a foreign wine in anything like a pure state. But I was bashful enough to drink it, and say nothing. Being in a pleasant frame of mind, from which I infer that poisoning is not always disagreeable in some stages of the process, I resolved to go to the play. It was Covent Garden Theatre that I chose, and there, from the back of a centre box, I saw Julius Caesar and the new pantomime. To have all those noble Romans alive before me, and walking in and out for my entertainment, instead of being the stern taskmasters they had been at school, was a most novel and delightful effect. But the mingled reality and mystery of the whole show, the influence upon me of the poetry, the lights, the music, the company, and the smooth, stupendous changes of glittering and brilliant scenery, were so dazzling, and opened up such illimitable regions of delight, that when I came out into the rainy street, at twelve o'clock at night, I felt as if I had come from the clouds, where I had been leading a romantic life for ages, to a bawling, splashing, link-lighted, umbrella, struggling, hackney-coach, jostling, patent-clinking, muddy, miserable world. 
I had emerged by another door, and stood in the street for a little while, as if I really were a stranger upon earth, but the unceremonious pushing and hustling that I received soon recalled me to myself, and put me in the road back to my hotel, whither I went revolving the glorious visions all the way, and where, after some porter and oysters, I sat revolving it still at past one o'clock with my eyes on the coffee-room fire. I was so filled with the play and with the past, for it was in a manner like a shining transparency through which I saw my earlier life moving along, that I don't know when the figure of a handsome, well-formed young man, dressed with a tasteful, easy negligence which I have reason to remember very well, became a real presence to me. But I recollect being conscious of his company without having noticed his coming in, and my still sitting musing over the coffee-room fire. At last I rose to go to bed, much to the relief of the sleepy waiter who had got the fidgets in his legs and was twisting them and hitting them and putting them through all kinds of contortions in his small pantry. In going towards the door I passed the person who had come in and saw him plainly. I turned directly, came back and looked again. He did not know me, but I knew him in a moment. At another time I might have wanted the confidence or the decision to speak to him, and might have put it off till next day, and might have lost him. But in the then condition of my mind, where the play was still running high, his former protection of me appeared so deserving of my gratitude, and my old love for him overflowed my breast so freshly and spontaneously, that I went up to him at once with a fast-beating heart and said, "'Steerforth, won't you speak to me?' He looked at me, just as he used to look sometimes, but I saw no recognition in his face. "'You don't remember me, I'm afraid,' I said. "'By God!' he suddenly exclaimed, "'It's little Copperfield!' I grasped him by both hands and could not let him go. But for very shame and the fear that it might displease him, I could have held him round the neck and cried. "'I never, never, never was so glad, my dear Steerforth. I am so overjoyed to see you.' "'I am as rejoiced to see you too,' he said, shaking my hands heartily. "'Why, Copperfield, old boy, don't be so overpowered!' And yet he was glad too, I thought, to see how the delight I had in meeting him affected me. I brushed away the tears that my utmost resolution had not been able to keep back, and made a clumsy laugh at it, and we sat down together, side by side. "'Why, how do you come to be here?' said Steerforth, clapping me on the shoulder. "'I came here by the Canterbury coach to-day. I have been adopted by an aunt down in that part of the country, and have just finished my education there. How do you come to be here, Steerforth?' "'Well, I am what they call an Oxford man,' he returned. "'That is to say, I get bored to death down there periodically, and I am on my way now to my mother's. You're a devilish amiable-looking fellow, Copperfield. Just what you used to be now I look at you, not altered in the least.' "'I knew you immediately,' I said, but you are more easily remembered.' He laughed as he ran his hand through the clustering curls of his hair, and said gaily, "'Yes, I am on an expedition of duty.' My mother lives a little way out of town, and the roads being in a beastly condition, and our house tedious enough, I remained here to-night instead of going on. I have not been in town half a dozen hours, and those I have been dozing and grumbling away at the play. I have been to the play too, said I, at Covent Garden. What a delightful and magnificent entertainment, Steerforth. Steerforth laughed heartily. Uh, my dear young Davy, he said, clasping me on the shoulder again, you are a very daisy. The daisy of the field at sunrise is not fresher than you are. I have been at Covent Garden too, and there never was a more miserable business. Hello, you saw. This was addressed to the waiter, who had been very attentive to our recognition, at a distance, and now came forward deferentially. Where have you put my friend, Mr. Copperfield? said Steerforth. Beg your pardon, sir. Uh, where did he sleep? What's his number? You know what I mean, said Steerforth. Well, sir said the waiter, with an apologetic air. Mr. Copperfield is at present in forty-four, sir. "'What the devil do you mean?' said Steerforth. "'By putting Mr. Copperfield into a little loft, over a stable?' "'Why, you see, we wasn't aware, sir,' returned the waiter, still apologetically, "'as Mr. Copperfield was anyways particular. "'We can give Mr. Copperfield seventy-two, sir, if it would be preferred. "'Next to you, sir.' "'Of course it would be preferred,' said Steerforth. "'And do it at once.' The waiter immediately withdrew to make the exchange. Steerforth, very much amused at my having been put into forty-four, laughed again, and clapped me on the shoulder again, and invited me to breakfast with him next morning at ten o'clock, an invitation I was only too proud and happy to accept. 
It being pretty late, we took our candles and went upstairs, where we parted with friendly heartiness at his door, and where I found my new room a great improvement on my old one, it not being at all musty, and having an immense four-post bedstead in it, which was quite a little landed estate. Here, among pillows enough for six, I soon fell asleep in a blissful condition, and dreamed of ancient Rome, Steerforth, and friendship, until the early morning coaches rumbling out of the archway beneath made me dream of thunder and the gods. End of chapter 19of David Copperfield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ty Kynes. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter 20. Steerforth's Home. When the chambermaid tapped at my door at eight o'clock and informed me that my shaving water was outside, I felt severely the having no occasion for it and blushed in my bed. The suspicion that she laughed, too, when she said it, preyed upon my mind all the time I was dressing, and gave me, I was conscious, a sneaking and guilty air when I passed her on the staircase as I was going down to breakfast. I was so sensitively aware, indeed, of being younger than I could have wished, that for some time I could not make up my mind to pass her at all, under the ignoble circumstances of the case, but hearing her there with a broom, stood peeping out of window at King Charles on horseback, surrounded by a maze of hackney-coaches, and looking anything but regal in a drizzling rain and a dark brown fog, until I was admonished by the waiter that the gentleman was waiting for me. It was not in the coffee-room that I found Steerforth expecting me, but in a snug private apartment, red-curtained and turkey-carpeted, where the fire burnt bright and a fine hot breakfast was set forth on a table covered with a clean cloth, and a cheerful miniature of the room, the fire, the breakfast, Steerforth and all, was shining in a little round mirror over the sideboard. I was rather bashful at first, Steerforth being so self-possessed and elegant and superior to me in all respects, age included, but his easy patronage soon put that to rights and made me quite at home. I could not enough admire the change he had wrought in the golden cross, or compare the dull forlorn state I had held yesterday with this morning's comforts and this morning's entertainment. As to the waiter's familiarity, it was quenched as if it had never been. He attended on us, as I may say, in sackcloth and ashes. "'Now, Copperfield,' said Steerforth, when we were alone, "'I should like to hear what you are doing, and where you are going, and all about you. I feel as if you were my property.' Glowing with pleasure to find that he still had this interest in me, I told him how my aunt had proposed the little expedition that I had before me, and whither it tended. "'As you are in no hurry, then,' said Steerforth, "'come home with me to Highgate, and stay a day or two. You will be pleased with my mother. She is a little vain and prosy about me, but that you can forgive her, and she will be pleased to see you. I should like to be as sure of that, as you are kind enough to say you are, I answered, smiling. Oh, said Steerforth, everyone who likes me has a claim on her that is sure to be acknowledged. Uh, then I think I shall be a favourite, said I. Good, said Steerforth, come and prove it. We will go and see the lions for an hour or two. It's something to have a fresh fellow like you to show them to Copperfield, and then we'll journey out to Highgate by coach. I could hardly believe but that I was in a dream, and that I should wake presently in number 44 to the solitary box in the coffee-room and the familiar waiter again. After I had written to my aunt and told her of my fortunate meeting with my admired old schoolfellow and my acceptance of his invitation, we went out in a hackney chariot and saw a panorama and some other sights and took a walk through the museum, where I could not help observing how much Steerforth knew, on an infinite variety of subjects, and of how little account he seemed to make his knowledge. "'You'll take a high degree at college, Steerforth,' said I, "'if you have not done so already.' and they will have good reason to be proud of you. "'Take a degree,' cried Steerforth. "'Not I, my dear Daisy. Will you mind my calling you Daisy?' "'Not at all,' said I. "'That's a good fellow, my dear Daisy,' said Steerforth, laughing. "'I have not the least desire or intention to distinguish myself in that way. I have done quite sufficient for my purpose. I find that I am heavy company enough for myself as I am.' "'But the fame,' I was beginning, "'You romantic Daisy,' said Steerforth, laughing still more heartily. "'Why should I trouble myself that a parcel of heavy-headed fellows may gape and hold up their hands? Let them do it at some other man. 
There's fame for him, and he's welcome to it. I was abashed at having made so great a mistake, and was glad to change the subject. Fortunately it was not difficult to do, for Steerforth could always pass from one subject to another, with a carelessness and lightness that were his own. Lunch succeeded to our sightseeing, and the short winter day wore away so fast that it was dusk when the stage-coach stopped with us at an old brick house at Highgate on the summit of the hill. An elderly lady, though not very far advanced in years, with a proud carriage and a handsome face, was at the doorway as we alighted, and greeting Steerforth as, "'My dearest James,' folded him in her arms. To this lady he presented me as his mother, and she gave me a stately welcome. It was a genteel old-fashioned house, very quiet and orderly. From the windows of my room I saw all London lying in the distance like a great vapour with here and there some lights twinkling through it. I had only time in dressing to glance at the solid furniture, the framed pieces of work, done, I supposed, by Steerforth's mother when she was a girl, and some pictures in crayons of ladies with powdered hair and bodices, coming and going on the walls as the newly kindled fire crackled and sputtered when I was called to dinner. There was a second lady in the dining-room, of a slight short figure, dark and not agreeable to look at, but with some appearance of good looks too, who attracted my attention. Perhaps because I had not expected to see her, perhaps because I found myself sitting opposite to her, perhaps because of something really remarkable in her. She had black hair and eager black eyes, and was thin, and had a scar upon her lip. It was an old scar. I should rather call it seam, for it was not discoloured and had healed years ago, which had once cut through her mouth downward towards her chin, but was now barely visible across the table, except above and on her upper lip, the shape of which it had altered. I concluded in my own mind that she was about thirty years of age, and that she wished to be married. She was a little dilapidated, like a house with having been so long to let, yet had, as I have said, an appearance of good looks. Her thinness seemed to be the effect of some wasting fire within her, which found a vent under her gaunt eyes. She was introduced as Miss Dartle, and both Steerforth and his mother called her Rosa. I found that she lived there, and had been for a long time Mrs. Steerforth's companion. It appeared to me that she never said anything she wanted to say outright, but hinted it, and made a great deal more of it by this practice. For example, when Mrs. Steerforth observed, more in jest than earnest, that she feared her son led but a wild life at college, Miss Dartle put in thus. "'Oh, really? You know how ignorant I am, and that I only ask for information. But isn't it always so? I thought that kind of life was on all hands understood to be, eh?' "'It is education for a very grave profession, if you mean that, Rosa,' Mrs. Steerforth answered with some coldness. "'Oh, yes, that's very true.' returned Miss Dartle. But isn't it, though? I want to be put right if I am wrong. Isn't it really? Really what? said Mrs. Steerforth. Oh, you mean it's not, returned Miss Dartle. Well, I'm very glad to hear it. Now I know what to do. That's the advantage of asking. I never shall allow people to talk before me about wastefulness and profligy and so forth in connection with that life any more. And you will be right said Mrs. Steerforth. My son's tutor is a conscientious gentleman, and if I had not implicit reliance upon my son, I should have reliance on him. Should you? said Miss Dartle. Dear me! Conscientious, is he? Really conscientious now? Yes, I am convinced of it, said Mrs. Steerforth. How very nice! exclaimed Miss Dartle. What a comfort! really conscientious then he is not but of course he can't be if he is really conscientious well i shall be quite happy in my opinion of him from this time you can't think how it elevates him in my opinion to know for certain that he's really conscientious her own views of every question and her correction of everything that was said to which she was opposed miss dartle insinuated in the same way sometimes i could not conceal from myself with great power though in contradiction even of Steerforth. An instance happened before dinner was done. Mrs. Steerforth was speaking to me about my intention of going down into Suffolk. I said at hazard how glad I should be if Steerforth would only agree to go there with me, and explaining to him that I was going to see my old nurse and Mr. Peggotty's family, I reminded him of the boatman whom he had seen at school. "'Oh, that bluff fellow,' said Steerforth. "'He had a son with him, hadn't he?' No, that was his nephew, I replied, whom he adopted, though, as a son. 
He has a very pretty little niece, too, whom he adopted as a daughter. In short, his house, or rather his boat, for he lives in one on dry land, is full of people who are objects of his generosity and kindness. You would be delighted to see that household. Should I? said Steerforth. Well, I think I should. I must see what can be done. It would be worth a journey, not to mention the pleasure of a journey with you, Daisy, to see that sort of people together, and to make one of them. My heart leaped with a new hope of pleasure, but it was in reference to the tone in which he had spoken of that sort of people that Miss Dartle, whose sparkling eyes had been watchful of us, now broke in again. "'Oh, but really, do tell me, are they, though?' she said. "'Are they what, and are who what?' said Steerforth. "'That sort of people. Are they really animals and clods and beings of another order? I want to know so much.' "'Why, there's a pretty wide separation between them and us,' said Steerforth, with indifference. "'They are not expected to be as sensitive as we are. Their delicacy is not to be shocked or hurt easily. They are wonderfully virtuous, I dare say. Some people contend for that, at least. And I am sure I don't want to contradict them. But they have not very fine natures. They may be thankful that, like their coarse rough skins, they are not easily wounded.' "'Really?' said Miss Dartle. Well, I don't know now when I have been better pleased than to hear that. It's so consoling. It's such a delight to know that when they suffer they don't feel. Sometimes I have been quite uneasy for that sort of people. But now I shall just dismiss the idea of them altogether. Live and learn. I had my doubts, I confess, but now they're cleared up. I didn't know, and now I do. And that shows the advantage of asking, don't it? I believe that Steerforth had said what he said in jest, or to draw Miss Dartle out, and I expected him to say as much when she was gone, and we two were sitting before the fire. But he merely asked me what I thought of her. Well, she is very clever, is she not? I asked. Clever? She brings everything to a grindstone, said Steerforth, and sharpens it, as she has sharpened her own face and figure these years past. She has worn herself away by constant sharpening. She's all edge. "'What a remarkable scar that is upon her lip,' I said. Steerforth's face fell, and he paused a moment. "'Why, the fact is,' he returned, "'I did that.' "'By an unfortunate accident?' "'No. I was a young boy, and she exasperated me, and I threw a hammer at her. A promising young angel I must have been. I was deeply sorry to have touched on such a painful theme, but it was useless now.' "'She has borne the mark ever since, as you see,' said Steerforth, "'and she'll bear it to her grave if she ever rests in one, "'though I can hardly believe she ever will rest anywhere. "'She was the motherless child of a sort of cousin of my father's. "'He died one day. "'My mother, who was then a widow, brought her here to be company to her. "'She has a couple of thousand pounds of her own, "'and saves the interest of it every year to add to the principal. Hmm, "'There's the history of Miss Rosa Dartlefield. "'And I have no doubt she loves you like a brother,' said I. <laughs> retorted Steerforth, looking at the fire. Some brothers are not loved over much. And some love. But help yourself, Copperfield. We'll drink the daisies of the field, in compliment to you. And the lilies of the valley that toil not, neither do they spin, in compliment of me. The more shame for me. A moody smile that had overspread his features cleared off as he said this merrily, and he was his own frank winning self again. I could not help glancing at the scar with a painful interest when we went to tea. It was not long before I observed that it was the most susceptible part of her face, and that when she turned pale that mark altered first, and became a dull lead-coloured streak, lengthening out to its full extent, like a mark in invisible ink brought to the fire. There was a little altercation between her and Steerforth about a cast of the dice at backgammon, when I thought of her for one moment in a storm of rage, and then I saw it start forth like the old writing on the wall. It was no matter of wonder to me to find Mrs. Steerforth devoted to her son. She seemed to be able to speak or think about nothing else. She showed me his picture as an infant in a locket, with some of his baby hair in it. She showed me his picture as he had been when I first knew him, and she wore at her breast his picture as he was now. All the letters he had ever written to her she kept in a cabinet near her own chair by the fire, and she would have read some of them, and I should have been very glad to hear them too, if he had not interposed and coaxed her out of the design. "'It was at Mr. Creakle's, my son tells me, that you first became acquainted,' said Mrs. Steerforth, as she and I were talking at one table while they played backgammon at another. "'Indeed, I recollect his speaking at the time of a pupil younger than himself who had taken his fancy there.' 
but your name as you may suppose has not lived in my memory he was very generous and noble to me in those days i assure you ma'am said i and i stood in need of such a friend i should have been quite crushed without him he is always generous and noble said mrs steerforth proudly i subscribed to this with all my heart god knows she knew i did for the stateliness of her manner already abated towards me except when she spoke in praise of him and then her air was always lofty it is not a fit school generally for my son said she far from it but there were particular circumstances to be considered at the time of more importance even than that selection my son's high spirit made it desirable that he should be placed with some man who felt its superiority and would be content to bow before it himself and we found such a man there i knew that knowing the fellow and yet i did not despise him the more for it but thought it a redeeming quality in him if he could be allowed any grace for not resisting one so irresistible as steerforth my son's great capacity was tempted on there by a feeling of voluntary emulation and conscious pride the fond lady went on to say he would have risen against all constraint but he found himself the monarch of the place and he haughtily determined to be worthy of his station it was like himself i echoed with all my heart and soul that it was like himself so my son took of his own will and on no compulsion to the course in which he can always when it is his pleasure outstrip every competitor she pursued my son informs me mr copperfield that you are quite devoted to him and that when you met yesterday you made yourself known to him with tears of joy i should be an affected woman if i made any pretence of being surprised by my son's inspiring such emotions but i cannot be indifferent to any one who is so sensible of his merit i am very glad to see you here and i can assure you that he feels an unusual friendship for you and that you may rely on his protection miss dartle played backgammon as eagerly as she did everything else if i had seen her first at the board i should have fancied that her figure had got thin and her eyes had got large over that pursuit and no other in the world but i am very much mistaken if she missed a word of this or lost a look of mine as i received it with the utmost pleasure and honoured by mrs steerforth's confidence felt older than i had done since i left canterbury when the evening was pretty far spent and a tray of glasses and decanters came in steerforth promised over the fire that he would seriously think of going down into the country with me there was no hurry he said a week hence would do and his mother hospitably said the same while we were talking he more than once called me daisy which brought miss dartle out again but really mr copperfield she asked is it a nickname and why does he give it you is it eh because he thinks you young and innocent i am so stupid in these things i coloured in replying that i believed it was oh said miss dartle now i am glad to know that i ask for information and i am glad to know it he thinks you young and innocent and so you are his friend well that is quite delightful she went to bed soon after this and mrs steerforth retired also steerforth and i after lingering for half an hour over the fire talking about traddles and all the rest of them at old salem house went upstairs together steerforth's room was next to mine and i went in to look at it it was a picture of comfort full of easy chairs cushions and footstools worked by his mother's hand and with no sort of thing omitted that could help to render it complete finally her handsome features looked down on her darling from a portrait on the wall as if it were even something to her that her likeness should watch him while he slept i found the fire burning clear enough in my room by this time and the curtains drawn before the windows and round the bed giving it a very snug appearance i sat down in a great chair upon the hearth to meditate on my happiness and had enjoyed the contemplation of it for some time when i found a likeness of miss dartle looking eagerly at me from above the chimney-piece it was a startling likeness and necessarily had a startling look the painter hadn't made the scar but i made it and there it was coming and going now confined to the upper lip as i had seen it at dinner and now showing the whole extent of the wound inflicted by the hammer as i had seen it when she was passionate i wondered peevishly why they couldn't put her somewhere else instead of quartering her with me i tried to get rid of her i undressed quickly extinguishing my light and went to bed but as i fell asleep i could not forget that she was still there looking is it really though i want to know and when i awoke in the night i found that i was uneasily asking all sorts of people in my dreams whether it really was or not without knowing what i meant 
End of chapter 20Twenty one of David Copperfield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tig Hines. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter twenty one. Little Emily. There was a servant in that house, a man who, I understood, was usually with Steerforth, and had come into his service at the university, who was in appearance a pattern of respectability. I believe there never existed in his station a more respectable-looking man. He was taciturn, soft-footed, very quiet in his manner, deferential, observant, always at hand when wanted, and never near when not wanted, but his great claim to consideration was his respectability. He had not a pliant face, he had rather a stiff neck, rather a tight smooth head with short hair clinging to it at the sides, a soft way of speaking, with a peculiar habit of whispering the letter S so distinctly that he seemed to use it oftener than any other man. But every peculiarity that he had he made respectable. If his nose had been upside down he would have made that respectable. He surrounded himself with an atmosphere of respectability and walked secure in it. It would have been next to impossible to suspect him of anything wrong, he was so thoroughly respectable. Nobody could have thought of putting him in a livery, he was so highly respectable. To have imposed any derogatory work upon him would have been to inflict a wanton insult on the feelings of a most respectable man. And of this, I noticed, the women servants in the household were so intuitively conscious that they always did such work themselves, and generally while he read the paper by the pantry fire. Such a self-contained man I never saw, but in that quality, as in every other he possessed, he only seemed to be the more respectable. Even the fact that no one knew his Christian name seemed to form part of his respectability. Nothing could be objected against his surname, Littimer, by which he was known. Peter might have been hanged or Tom transported, but Littimer was perfectly respectable. It was occasioned, I suppose, by the reverend nature of respectability in the abstract, but I felt particularly young in this man's presence. How old he was himself I could not guess, and that again went to his credit on the same score, for in the calmness of respectability he might have numbered fifty years as well as thirty. Littimer was in my room in the morning before I was up to bring me that reproachful shaving water and to put out my clothes. When I undrew the curtains and looked out of bed, I saw him in an equable temperature of respectability, unaffected by the east wind of January, and not even breathing frostily, standing my boots right and left in the first dancing position, and blowing specks of dust off my coat as he laid it down like a baby. I gave him good morning, and asked him what o'clock it was. He took out of his pocket the most respectable hunting watch I ever saw, and, preventing the spring with his thumb from opening far, looked in at the face as if he were consulting an oracular oyster, and shut it up again, and said, if I please, it was half-past eight. Uh, Mr. Steerforth will be glad to hear how you have rested, sir. Uh, thank you, I said. Very well indeed. Is Mr. Steerforth quite well? Uh, thank you, sir. Mr. Steerforth is tolerably well. Another of his characteristics, no use of superlatives, a cool, calm medium always. Is there anything more I can have the honour of doing for you, sir? The warning bell will ring at nine. The family take breakfast at half-past nine. Uh, nothing. I thank you. I thank you, sir, if you please. And with that, and with a little inclination of his head when he passed the bedside as an apology for correcting me, he went out, shutting the door as delicately as if I had just fallen into a sweet sleep on which my life depended. Every morning we held exactly this conversation, never any more and never any less, and yet invariably, however far I might have been lifted out of myself overnight and advanced towards maturer years by Steerforth's companionship or Mrs. Steerforth's confidence or Miss Dartle's conversation, in the presence of this most respectable man I became, as our smaller poets sing, a boy again. He got horses for us, and Steerforth, who knew everything, gave me lessons in riding. He provided foils for us, and Steerforth gave me lessons in fencing, gloves, and I began, of the same master, to improve in boxing. It gave me no manner of concern that Steerforth should find me a novice in these sciences, but I never could bear to show my want of skill before the respectable Littimer. 
I had no reason to believe that Littimer understood such arts himself. He never led me to suppose anything of the kind by so much as the vibration of one of his respectable eyelashes. Yet whensoever he was by while we were practising, I felt myself the greenest and most inexperienced of mortals. I am particular about this man because he made a particular effect on me at that time, and because of what took place thereafter. The week passed away in a most delightful manner. It passed rapidly, as may be supposed, to one entranced as I was, and yet it gave me so many occasions for knowing Steerforth better, and admiring him more in a thousand respects, that at its close I seemed to have been with him for a much longer time. A dashing way he had of treating me like a plaything was more agreeable to me than any behaviour he could have adopted. It reminded me of our old acquaintance. It seemed the natural sequel of it. It showed me that he was unchanged. It relieved me of any uneasiness I might have felt in comparing my merits with his, and measuring my claims upon his friendship by any equal standard. Above all, it was a familiar, unrestrained, affectionate demeanour that he used towards no one else. As he had treated me at school differently from all the rest, I joyfully believed that he treated me in life unlike any other friend he had. I believed that I was nearer to his heart than any other friend, and my own heart warmed with attachment to him. He made up his mind to go with me into the country, and the day arrived for our departure. He had been doubtful at first whether to take Littimer or not, but decided to leave him at home. The respectable creature, satisfied with his lot whatever it was, arranged our portmanteau on the little carriage that was to take us into London, as if they were intended to defy the shocks of ages, and received my modestly proffered donation with perfect tranquillity. We bid adieu to Mrs. Steerforth and Miss Dartle, with many thanks on my part, and much kindness on the devoted mother's. The last thing I saw was Littimer's unruffled eye, fraught, as I fancied, with the silent conviction that I was very young indeed. What I felt in returning so auspiciously to the old familiar places I shall not endeavour to describe. We went down by the mail. I was so concerned, I recollect, even for the honour of Yarmouth, that when Steerforth said, as we drove through its dark streets to the inn, that as well as he could make out, it was a good, queer, out-of-the-way kind of a hole, I was highly pleased. We went to bed on our arrival. I observed a pair of dirty shoes and gaiters in connection with my old friend the dolphin as we passed that door, and breakfasted late in the morning. Steerforth, who was in great spirits, had been strolling about on the beach before I was up, and had made acquaintance, he said, with half the boatmen in the place. Moreover, he had seen in the distance what he was sure must be the identical house of Mr. Peggotty, with smoke coming out of the chimney, and had had a great mind, he told me, to walk in and swear he was myself grown out of knowledge. "'When do you propose to introduce me there, Daisy?' he said. "'I am at your disposal. Make your own arrangements.' Why, I was thinking that this evening would be a good time, Steerforth, when they are all sitting round the fire. I should like you to see it when it's snug. It's such a curious place. So be it, returned Steerforth. This evening. I shall not give them any notice that we are here, you know, said I, delighted. We must take them by surprise. Oh, of course, it's no fun, said Steerforth, unless we take them by surprise. Let us see the natives in their aboriginal condition. Though they are that sort of people you mentioned, I returned. "'Ah, what? You recollect my skirmishes with Rosa, do you?' he exclaimed with a quick look. "'Confound the girl. I am half afraid of her. She's like a goblin to me, but never mind. Now, what are you going to do? You are going to see your nurse, I suppose?' "'Why, yes,' I said. "'I must see Peggotty, first of all.' "'Well,' replied Steerforth, looking at his watch, "'suppose I deliver you up to be cried over for a couple of hours. Is that long enough?' I answered, laughing, that I thought we might get through it in that time but that he must also come, for he would find that his renown had preceded him, and that he was almost as great a personage as I was. "'I'll come anywhere you like,' said Steerforth, "'or do anything you like. Tell me where to come to, and in two hours I'll produce myself in any state you please, sentimental or comical.' I gave him minute directions for finding the residence of Mr. Barkis, carrier to Blunderstone and elsewhere, and, on this understanding, went out alone. There was a sharp bracing air, the ground was dry, the sea was crisp and clear, the sun was diffusing abundance of light, if not much warmth, and everything was fresh and lively. I was so fresh and lively myself in the pleasure of being there that I could have stopped the people in the streets and shaken hands with them. 
The streets looked small, of course, the streets that we have only seen as children always do, I believe, when we go back to them, but I had forgotten nothing in them, and found nothing changed, until I came to Mr. Omer's shop. Omer and Yoram was now written up, where Omer used to be, but the inscription Draper, Tailor, Haberdasher, Funeral Furniture, and etc. remained as it was. My footsteps seemed to tend so naturally to the shop door, after I read these words from over the way, that I went across the road and looked in. There was a pretty woman at the back of the shop, dancing a little child in her arms, while another little fellow clung to her apron. I had no difficulty in recognising either Minnie or Minnie's children. The glass door of the parlour was not open, but in the workshop across the yard I could faintly hear the old tune playing, as if it had never left off. "'Is Mr. Omer at home?' I said, entering. "'I should like to see him for a moment, if he is.' "'Oh, yes, sir, he is at home,' said Minnie. "'The weather don't suit his asthma out of doors. "'Joe, call your grandfather.' The little fellow who was holding her apron gave such a lusty shout that the sound of it made him bashful, and he buried his face in her skirts to her great admiration. I heard a heavy puffing and blowing coming towards us, and soon Mr. Omer, shorter-winded than of yore, but not much older-looking, stood before me. "'Servant, sir,' said Mr. Omer. "'What can I do for you, sir?' "'You can shake hands with me, Mr. Omer, if you please,' I said, putting out my own. "'You were very good-natured to me once, when I'm afraid I didn't show that I thought so.' "'Was I, though?' returned the old man. I'm glad to hear it, uh, but I don't remember when. Are you sure it was me? Quite. I think my memory has got as short as my breath, said Mr. Omer, looking at me and shaking his head, uh, for I don't remember you. Uh, don't you remember your coming to the coach to meet me, and my having breakfast here, and our riding out to Blunderstone together, you and I, and Mrs. Yoram, and Mr. Yoram too, who wasn't her husband then? Oh, my lord bless my soul exclaimed mr omer after being thrown by this surprise into a fit of coughing <laughs> you, you don't say so minnie my dear you recollect dear me yes the party was a lady i think my mother i rejoined to be sure said mr omer touching my waistcoat with his forefinger and there was a little child too there was two parties the little party was laid along with the other party. Over at Blunderstone it was, of course. Dear me! And how have you been since? Very well, I thanked him, as I hoped he had been too. Oh, nothing to grumble at, you know, said Mr. Omer. I find my breath gets short, but it seldom gets longer as a man gets older. I take it as it comes, and make the most of it. That's the best way, ain't it? Mr. Omer coughed again in consequence of laughing, and was assisted out of his fit by his daughter, who now stood close beside us, dancing her smallest child on the counter. "'Dear me,' said Mr. Omer, "'yes, to be sure, two parties. Why, in that very ride, if you'll believe me, the day was named for Minnie to marry Yoram.' "'Do name it, sir,' says Yoram. "'Yes, do, father,' says Minnie. "'And now he's come into the business, and look here, the youngest.' Minnie laughed and stroked her banded hair upon her temples, as her father put one of his fat fingers into the hand of the child she was dancing on the counter. Two parties, of course,' said Mr. Omer, nodding his head retrospectively. "'Exactly so. And Yoram's at work at this minute, on a grey one with silver nails, not this measurement. The measurement of the dancing child upon the counter, by a good two inches. Will you take something?' I thanked him, but declined. "'Let me see,' said Mr. Omer. "'Barkis is the carrier's wife. Peggotty's the boatman's sister. She had something to do with your family. She was in service there, sure.' My answering in the affirmative gave him great satisfaction. "'I believe my breath will get long next. My memory's getting so much so,' said Mr. Omer. "'Well, sir, we've got a young relation of hers here, under articles to us that has as elegant a taste in the dressmaking business, uh, but I assure you, I don't believe there's a duchess in England can touch her. Uh, not little Emily, said I involuntarily. Emily's her name, said Mr. Omer, and she's little too, uh, but if you'll believe me, she has such a face of her own that half the women in this town are mad against her. Nonsense, father, cried Minnie. My dear, 
said Mr. Omer. "'I don't say it's the case with you,' winking at me. Uh, "'But I say that half the women in Yarmouth, uh, in a five-mile round, are mad against that girl.' "'Then she should have kept to her own station in life, father,' said Minnie, "'and not have given them any hold to talk about her, and then they couldn't have done it.' "'Couldn't have done it, my dear,' retorted Mr. Omer. They "'Couldn't have done it. That's your knowledge of life. What is there that any woman couldn't do, that she shouldn't do, especially on the subject of another woman's good looks?' I really thought it was all over for Mr. Omer, after he had uttered this libelous pleasantry. He coughed to that extent, and his breath eluded all his attempts to recover it with that obstinacy, that I fully expected to see his head go down behind the counter, and his little black breeches, with the rusty little bunches of ribbons at the knees, come quivering up in a last ineffectual struggle. At length, however, he got better, though he still panted hard, and was so exhausted that he was obliged to sit on the stool of the shop desk. "'You see,' he said, wiping his head and breathing with difficulty, "'she hasn't taken much to any companions here. She hasn't taken kindly to any particular acquaintances and friends, not to mention sweethearts. In consequence, an ill-natured story got about that Emily wanted to be a lady. Now my opinion is that it came into circulation principally on account of her sometimes saying at the school that if she was a lady she would like to do so-and-so for her uncle, don't you see, and buy him such and such fine things. I assure you, Mr. Omer, she has said so to me, I returned eagerly, when we were both children. Mr. Omer nodded his head and rubbed his chin. Just so. Then out of a very little she could dress herself, you see, better than most others out of a deal, and that made things unpleasant. Uh, moreover, she was rather what might be called wayward. I'll go so far as to say what I should call wayward myself, said Mr. Omer. I didn't know her own mind quite, a little spoiled, and couldn't at first exactly bind herself down. No more than that was ever said against her, Minnie. No, father, said Mrs. Yoram. That's the worst, I believe. So when she got a situation, said Mr. Omer, to keep a fractious old lady company, they didn't very well agree, and she didn't stop. At last she came here, apprenticed for three years. Nearly two of them are over, and she has been as good a girl as ever was. Worth any six. Minnie, is she worth any six now? Yes, father, replied Minnie. Never say I detracted from her. Very good, said Mr. Omer. That's right. And so, young gentleman, he added, after a few moments further rubbing of his chin, that you may not consider me long-winded, as well as short breathe. I believe that's all about it. As they had spoken in a subdued tone while speaking of Emily, I had no doubt that she was near. On my asking now if that were not so, Mr. Omer nodded yes, and nodded towards the door of the parlour. My hurried inquiry if I might peep in was answered with a free permission and looking through the glass I saw her sitting at her work. I saw her, a most beautiful little creature, with the cloudless blue eyes that had looked into my childish heart, turned laughingly upon another child of Minnie's who was playing near her, with enough of wilfulness in her bright face to justify what I had heard, and much of the old capricious coyness lurking in it, but with nothing in her pretty looks, I am sure, but what was meant for goodness and for happiness, and what was on a good and happy course. The tune across the yard that seemed as if it never had left off, alas, it was a tune that never does leave off, was beating softly all the while. "'Wouldn't you like to step in?' said Mr. Omer, and speak to her. "'Walk in and speak to her, sir. Make yourself at home.' I was too bashful to do so then. I was afraid of confusing her, and I was no less afraid of confusing myself, but I informed myself of the hour at which she left of an evening, in order that our visit might be timed accordingly, and, taking leave of Mr. Omer and his pretty daughter and her little children, went away to my dear old Peggotty's. Here she was in the tiled kitchen cooking dinner. The moment I knocked at the door she opened it and asked me what I pleased to want. I looked at her with a smile, but she gave me no smile in return. I had never ceased to write to her, but it must have been seven years since we had met. "'Is Mr. Barkis at home, ma'am?' I said, feigning to speak roughly to her. "'He's at home, sir,' returned Peggotty. "'But he's bad at bed with the rheumatics.' "'Don't he go over to Blunderstone now?' I asked. "'When he's well, he do,' she answered. "'Do you ever go there, Mrs. Barkis?' 
She looked at me more attentively, and I noticed a quick movement of her hands towards each other. "'Because I want to ask a question about a house there, that they call, what is it, the rookery,' said I. She took a step backward, and put out her hands in an undecided, frightened way, as if to keep me off. "'Peggotty!' I cried to her. She cried, "'My darling boy!' and we both burst into tears and were locked in one another's arms. What extravagances she committed, what laughing and crying over me, what pride she showed, what joy, what sorrow that she, whose pride and joy I might have been, could never hold me in a fond embrace I have not the heart to tell. I was troubled with no misgiving that it was young in me to respond to her emotions, that I never laughed and cried in all my life, I dare say, not even to her, more freely than I did that morning. "'Barkis will be so glad,' said Peggotty, wiping her eyes with her apron, "'that it'll do him more good than pints of liniment. "'May I go and tell him you are here? "'Will you come up and see him, my dear?' "'Of course I would. "'But Peggotty would not get out of the room as easily as she meant to, "'for as often as she got to the door and looked round at me, "'she came back again to have another laugh and another cry upon my shoulder. "'At last, to make the matter easier, I went upstairs with her, "'and having waited outside for a minute, "'while she said a word of preparation to Mr. Barkis, "'presented myself before that invalid. "'He received me with absolute enthusiasm. "'He was too rheumatic to be shaken hands with, "'but he begged me to shake the tassels on the top of his nightcap, which I did most cordially. When I sat down by the side of the bed, he said to me that it did him the world of good to feel as if he was driving me on the Blunderstone Road again. As he lay in bed, face upward, and so covered with that exception that he seemed to be nothing but a face, like a conventional cherubim, he looked the queerest object I ever beheld. "'What name was it as I wrote up in the cart, sir?' said Barkis with a slow rheumatic smile. Ha, ah, Mr. Barkis, we had some grave talks about that matter, hadn't we? I was willing a long time, sir, said Mr. Barkis. A long time, said I. And I don't regret it, said Mr. Barkis. Do you remember what you told me once about her making all the apple parsties and doing all the cooking? Yes, very well, I returned. It was true, said Mr. Barkis, as turnips is. It was true said Mr. Barkis, nodding his nightcap, which was his only means of emphasis, as taxes is, and nothing's truer than them. Mr. Barkis turned his eyes upon me, as if for my assent to this result of his reflections in bed, and I gave it. "'Nothing's truer than them,' repeated Mr. Barkis. "'A man as poor as I am finds that out in his mind when he's laid up. I'm a very poor man, sir.' "'I am sorry to hear it, Mr. Barkis.' "'A very poor man. Indeed I am,' said Mr. Barkis. Here his right hand came slowly and feebly from under the bedclothes, and with a purposeless, uncertain grasp took hold of a stick which was loosely tied to the side of the bed. After some poking about with this instrument, in the course of which his face assumed a variety of distracted expressions, Mr. Barkis poked it against a box, an end of which had been visible to me all the time. Then his face became composed. "'Old clothes,' said Mr. Barkis. "'Oh,' said I. "'I wish it was money, sir,' said Mr. Barkis. "'I wished it was indeed,' said I. "'But it ain't,' said Mr. Barkis, opening both his eyes as wide as he possibly could. I expressed myself quite sure of that, and Mr. Barkis, turning his eyes more gently to his wife, said, "'She's the usefulest and best of women, C. P. Barkis.' All the praise that any one can give to C. P. Barkis she deserves, and more. My dear, you'll get a dinner today for company, something good to eat and drink, will you? I should have protested against this unnecessary demonstration in my honour, but that I saw Peggotty on the opposite side of the bed extremely anxious I should not, so I held my peace. I got a trifle of money somewhere about me, my dear, said Mr. Barkis, but I'm a little tired. "'If you and Mr. David will leave me for a short nap, I'll try and find it when I wake.' We left the room in compliance with this request. When we got outside the door, Peggotty informed me that Mr. Barkis, being now a little nearer than he used to be, always resorted to this same device before producing a single coin from his store, and that he endured unheard-of agonies in crawling out of bed alone and taking it from that unlucky box.' 
in effect we presently heard him uttering suppressed groans of the most dismal nature as this magpie proceeding racked him in every joint but while peggotty's eyes were full of compassion for him she said his generous impulse would do him good and it was better not to check it so he groaned on until he had got into bed again suffering i have no doubt a martyrdom and then he called us in pretending to have just woke up from a refreshing sleep and to produce a guinea from under his pillow his satisfaction in which happy imposition on us and in having preserved the impenetrable secret of the box appeared to be a sufficient compensation to him for all his tortures i prepared peggotty for steerforth's arrival and it was not long before he came i am persuaded she knew no difference between his having been a personal benefactor of hers and a kind friend to me and that she would have received him with the utmost gratitude and devotion in any case but his easy spirited good humour his genial manner his handsome looks his natural gift of adapting himself to whomsoever he pleased and making direct when he cared to do it to the main point of interest in anybody's heart bound her to him wholly in five minutes his manner to me alone would have won her but through all these causes combined i sincerely believe she had a kind of adoration for him before he left the house that night he stayed there with me to dinner. If I were to say willingly, I should not half express how readily and gaily. He went to Mr. Barkis's room like light and air, brightening and refreshing it as if he were healthy weather. There was no noise, no effort, no consciousness in anything he did, but in everything an indescribable lightness, a seeming impossibility of doing anything else, or doing anything better, which was so graceful, so natural and agreeable, that it overcomes me even now in the remembrance. We made merry in the little parlour where the book of martyrs unthumbed since my time was laid out upon the desk as of old, and where I now turned over its terrific pictures, remembering the old sensations they had wakened, but not feeling them. When Peggotty spoke of what she called my room, and of its being ready for me at night, and of her hoping I would occupy it, before I could so much as look at Steerforth hesitating, he was possessed of the whole case of course he said you'll sleep there while we stay and i shall sleep at the hotel but to bring you so far i returned and to separate seems bad companionship steerforth why in the name of heaven where do you naturally belong he said what is seems compared to that it was settled at once he maintained all his delightful qualities to the last until we started forth at eight o'clock for mr peggotty's boat indeed they were more and more brightly exhibited as the hours went on for i thought even then and i have no doubt now that the consciousness of success in his determination to please inspired him with a new delicacy of perception and made it subtle as it was more easy to him if any one had told me then that all this was a brilliant game played for the excitement of the moment for the employment of high spirits in the thoughtless love of superiority in a mere wasteful careless course of winning what was worthless to him and next minute thrown away i say if any one had told me such a lie that night i wonder in what manner of receiving it my indignation would have found a vent probably only in an increase had that been possible of the romantic feelings of fidelity and friendship with which i walked beside him over the dark wintry sands towards the old boat the wind sighing round us even more mournfully than it had sighed and moaned upon the night when i first darkened mr peggotty's door <laughs> this is a kind of wild place steerforth is it not dismal enough in the dark he said and the sea roars as if it were hungry for us is that the boat where i see the light yonder that's the boat said i and it's the same i saw this morning he returned i came straight to it by instinct i suppose we said no more as we approached the light but made softly for the door i laid my hand upon the latch and whispering steerforth to keep close to me went in a murmur of voices had been audible on the outside and at the moment of our entrance a clapping of hands which latter noise i was surprised to see proceeded from the generally disconsolate mrs gummidge but mrs gummidge was not the only person there who was unusually excited mr peggotty his face lighted up with uncommon satisfaction and laughing with all his might held his rough arms wide open as if for little emily to run into them ham with a mixed expression in his face of admiration exultation and a lumbering sort of bashfulness that sat upon him very well held little emily by the hand as if he were presenting her to mr peggotty little emily herself 
blushing and shy but delighted with mr peggotty's delight as her joyous eyes expressed was stopped by our entrance for she saw us first in the very act of springing from ham to nestle in mr peggotty's embrace in the first glimpse we had of them all and at the moment of our passing from the dark cold night into the warm light room this was the way in which they were all employed mrs gummidge in the background clapping her hands like a madwoman the little picture was so instantaneously dissolved by our going in that one might have doubted whether it had ever been i was in the midst of the astonished family face to face with mr peggotty and holding out my hand to him when ham shouted master davy it's master davy in a moment we were all shaking hands with one another and asking one another how we did and telling one another how glad we were to meet and all talking at once mr peggotty was so proud and overjoyed to see us that he did not know what to do or say but kept over and over again shaking hands with me and then with steerforth and then with me and then ruffling his shaggy hair all over his head and laughing with such glee and triumph that it was a treat to see him why that you two gentlemen gentlemen growed should come to this here roof to-night of all nights of my life said mr peggotty it's such a thing as never happened afore i do rightly believe little emily my darling come here come here my little witch there's master davy's friend my dear there's the gentleman as you've heard on emily he comes to see you along with master davy on the brightest night of your uncle's life as ever was or ever will be come to the one and hurrah for it after delivering this speech all in a breath and with extraordinary animation and pleasure mr peggotty put one of his large hands rapturously on each side of his niece's face and kissing it a dozen times laid it with a gentle pride and love upon his broad chest and patted it as if his hand had been a lady's then he let her go and as she ran into the little chamber where i used to sleep looked round upon us quite hot and out of breath with his uncommon satisfaction if you two gentlemen gentlemen growed now and such gentlemen said mr peggotty so they are so they are cried ham well said so they are master davy bore gentlemen growed so they are if you two gentlemen gentlemen growed said mr peggotty don't excuse me for being in a state of mind when you understand matters i'll ask your pardon emily my dear she knows i'm going to tell here his delight broke out again and has made off would you be so good as to look after her mortar for a minute mrs gummidge nodded and disappeared if this ain't said mr peggotty sitting down among us by the fire the brightest night of my life i'm a shellfish boiled too and more i can't say this here little emily sir in a low voice to steerforth her as you see a blushing here just now steerforth nodded but with such a pleased expression of interest and of participation in mr peggotty's feelings that the latter answered him as if he had spoken to be sure said mr peggotty that's her and so she is thank ye sir ham nodded to me several times as if he would have said so too this here little emily of ours said mr peggotty has been in our house what i suppose i'm an ignorant man but that's my belief no one but a little bright-eyed creature can be in a house she ain't my child never had one but i couldn't love her more you understand i couldn't do it i quite understand said steerforth i know you do sir returned mr peggotty and thank ye again master davy he can remember what she was you may judge from your own self what she is but neither of you can't fully know what she has been is and will be to my loving heart i'm rough sir said mr peggotty i'm as rough as a sea porcupine but no one unless mayhap it is a woman can know i think what our little emily is to me and betwixt ourselves sinking his voice lower yet that woman's name ain't mrs gummidge neither though she has a world of merits mr peggotty ruffled his hair again with both hands as a further preparation for what he was going to say and went on with a hand upon each of his knees there was a certain person as has knowed our emily from the time when her father was drownded as has seen her constant when a babby when a young girl when a woman not much of a person to look at he wasn't said mr peggotty something of my own build rough a good deal of sou'wester in him very salt but on the whole a honest sort of a chap with his heart in the right place i thought i had never seen ham grin to anything like the extent to which he sat grinning at us now what does this ere blessed tarpaulin go and do said mr peggotty with his face one high noon of enjoyment 
but he loses that there heart of his to our little emily he follows her about he makes hisself a sort of servant to her he loses in a great measure his relish for his wittles and in the long run he makes it clear to me what's amiss now i could wish myself you see that our little emily was in a fair way of being married i could wish to see her in all events under articles to a honest man as had right to defend her i don't know how long i may live or how soon i may die but i know that if i was capsized any night in a gale of wind in yarmouth roads here and was to see the town light shining for the last time over the rollers as i couldn't make no head against i could go down quieter for thinking there's a man ashore there iron true to my little emily god bless her and no wrong can touch my emily well so be as that man lives mr peggotty in simple earnestness waved his right arm as if he were waving at the town lights for the last time, and then, exchanging a nod with Ham, whose eye he caught, proceeded as before. "'Well, I counsels him to speak to Emily. He's big enough, but he's bashfuller than a little un, and he don't like, so I speak.' "'What, him?' says little Emily. "'Him that I've known so intimate so many years, and like so much. Oh, uncle, I never can have him. He's such a good fellow.' I gives her a kiss, and I says no more to her than, "'My dear, you are right to speak out. You're to choose for yourself. You're as free as a little bird.' Then I aways to him, and I says, "'I wish it could have been so, but it can't. But you can both be as you was, and what I say to you is, be as you was with her, like a man.' He says to me, as shaking in my hand, "'I will,' he says. And he was, honourable and manful for two year going on, and we was just the same at home here as afore.' Mr. Peggotty's face, which had varied in its expression with the various stages of his narrative, now resumed all its former triumphant delight, as he laid a hand upon my knee and a hand upon Steerforth's, previously wetting them both for the greater emphasis of the action, and divided the following speech between us. All of a sudden, one evening, as it might be tonight, comes little Emily from her work and him with her. There ain't so much in that, you'll say. No, because he takes care on her like a brother, after dark, and indeed afore dark, and at all times. But this tarpaulin chap, she takes hold of her hand, and he cries out to me, joyful, Look here, this is to be my little wife. And she says, half bold and half shy, and half a laughing and half a crying, Yes, uncle, if you please. If I please, cried Mr. Peggotty, rolling his head in an ecstasy at the idea. Lord, as if I should do anything else. If you please, I am steadier now, and I have thought the better of it, and I'll be as good a little wife as I can to him, for he's a dear good fellow. Then Mrs. Gummidge, she claps her hands like a play, and you come in. There, the murder's out, said Mr. Peggotty. You come in. It took place this here present hour, and here's the man that'll marry her the minute she's out of her time. Ham staggered, as well he might, under the blow Mr. Peggotty dealt him in his unbounded joy, as a mark of confidence and friendship, but feeling called upon to say something to us, he said, with much faltering and great difficulty, "'She weren't no higher than you was, Master Davy, when you first come, when I thought what she'd growed up to be. I seed her grown up gentleman like a flower. I'd lay down my life for a Master Davy. Oh, most content and cheerful. She's more to me, gentlemen, than... She's all to me that I can want, and more than I ever, than I ever could say. I love her true. There ain't a gentleman in all the world, nor yet sailing upon all the sea, that can love his lady more than I love her, though there's many a common man would say better what he meant. I thought it affecting to see such a sturdy fellow as Ham was, now trembling at the strength of what he felt for the pretty little creature who had won his heart i thought the simple confidence reposed in us by mr peggotty and by himself was in itself affecting i was affected by the story altogether how far my emotions were influenced by the recollections of my childhood i don't know whether i had come there with any lingering fancy that i was still to love little emily i don't know i know that i was filled with pleasure by all this but at first with an indescribably sensitive pleasure that a very little would have changed to pain Therefore, if it had depended upon me to touch the prevailing chord among them with any skill, I should have made a poor hand of it. But it depended upon Steerforth, and he did it with such address that in a few minutes we were all as easy and as happy as it was possible to be. "'Mr. Peggotty, he said, "'you are a thoroughly good fellow, and deserve to be as happy as you are to-night. My hand upon it. Ham, I give you joy, my boy.' 
my hand upon that too. Daisy, stir the fire and make it a brisk one. And, Mr. Peggotty, unless you can induce your gentle niece to come back, for whom I vacate this seat in the corner, I shall go. Any gap at your fireside on such a night, such a gap least of all, I wouldn't make for the wealth of the Indies. So Mr. Peggotty went into my old room to fetch little Emily. At first little Emily didn't like to come, and then Ham went. Presently they brought her to the fireside very much confused and very shy, but soon she became more assured when she found how gently and respectfully Steerforth spoke to her, how skilfully he avoided anything that would embarrass her, how he talked to Mr. Peggotty of boats and ships and tides and fish, how he referred to me about the time when he had seen Mr. Peggotty at Salem House, how delighted he was with the boat and all belonging to it how lightly and easily he carried on until he brought us by degrees into a charmed circle and we were all talking away without any reserve emily indeed said little all the evening but she looked and listened and her face got animated and she was charming steerforth told a story of a dismal shipwreck which arose out of his talk with mr peggotty as if he saw it all before him and little emily's eyes were fastened on him all the time as if she saw it too he told us a merry adventure of his own, as a relief to that, with as much gaiety as if the narrative was as fresh to him as it was to us, and little Emily laughed until the boat rang with the musical sounds, and we all laughed, Steerforth too, in irresistible sympathy with what was so pleasant and light-hearted. We got Mr. Peggotty to sing, or rather roar, when the stormy winds do blow, do blow, do blow, and he sang a sailor song himself so pathetically and beautifully that I could have almost fancied that the real wind creeping sorrowfully round the house and murmuring low through our unbroken silence was there to listen. As to Mrs. Gummidge, he roused that victim of despondency with a success never attained by anyone else, so Mr. Peggotty informed me, since the decease of the old one he left her so little leisure for being miserable that she said next day she thought she must have been bewitched but he set up no monopoly of the general attention or the conversation when little emily grew more courageous and talked but still bashfully across the fire to me of her old wanderings upon the beach to pick up shells and pebbles and when i asked her if she recollected how i used to be devoted to her and when we both laughed and reddened casting these looks back on the pleasant old times so unreal to look at now he was silent and attentive, and observed us thoughtfully. She sat at this time and all the evening on the old locker in her old little corner by the fire. Ham sat beside her where I used to sit. I could not satisfy myself whether it was in her own little tormenting way, or in a maidenly reserve before us, that she kept quite close to the wall and away from him, but I observed that she did so all the evening. As I remember, it was almost midnight when we took our leave. We had had some biscuits and dried fish for supper, and Steerforth had produced from his pocket a full flask of Hollands, which we men, I may say we men now without a blush, had emptied. We parted merrily, and as they all stood crowded round the door to light us as far as they could upon our road, I saw the sweet blue eyes of little Emily peeping after us from behind Ham, and heard her soft voice calling to us to be careful how we went. "'A most engaging little beauty,' said Steerforth, taking my arm. "'Well, it's a quaint place, and they're quaint company, and it's quite a new sensation to mix with them.' "'How fortunate we are, too,' I returned, "'to have arrived to witness their happiness in that intended marriage. "'I never saw people so happy. "'How delightful to see it, and to be made the sharers in their honest joy, as we have been.' "'That's rather a chuckle-headed fellow for the girl, isn't he?' said Steerforth. He had been so hearty with him, and with them all, that I felt a shock in this unexpected and cold reply. But turning quickly upon him, and seeing a laugh in his eyes, I answered, much relieved, "'Ah, Steerforth, it's well for you to joke about the poor. You may skirmish with Miss Dartle, or try to hide your sympathies in jests from me, but I know better. I see how perfectly you understand them, how exquisitely you can enter into happiness like this plain fisherman's, or humour a love like my old nurse's. I know that there's not a joy or sorrow, not an emotion of such people, that can be indifferent to you. And I admire and love you for it, Steerforth, twenty times more." He stopped, and, looking at my face, said, "'Daisy, I believe you are in earnest, and are good. I wish we all were.' Next moment he was gaily singing Mr. Peggotty's song, as we walked at a round pace back to Yarmouth. End of chapter 21